we speak about policy makers, nationally determined contributions, global stock take, etc., cetera, et cetera. And I think we are missing reaching out to most of the world populations who don't normally know about the processes, the UNFCCC or UN Climate Change Process, the UN Convention Against Desertification, the Global Goals, etc. So our jobs, the jobs of everybody in this table today, is to raise awareness in a language that is understandable and that it is impactful. Translate all the processy language into narratives that are meaningful to the people in the street. And without further delay, I would like uh, to introduce our amazing panel of experts. To my left, thank you, Keisha, thank you very much for joining us today. You are, I think, a bit of our host. You are the only UN uh, organization, the United Nations Environment Program, which is based in, in Africa, something that the, the Kenyan president uh, underscored uh, this, these days, and I think that it is an important message that we all should take notice of. So Keisha Rukikaide is the head of media at the UN Environment Program based here in, in Nairobi. To her left, we have Leon Midigu. Leon is an award-winning uh, journalist, is expert in uh, health and expert on science as well. We just had an event about science organized by UNESCO in this room, very interesting. And, uh, and Leon is very busy these days. Thank you, Leon, because I know how, how important this summit, the first climate summit in Africa taking place these days here in Nairobi, how important it is to, I hope, uh, speak to everybody that you have uh, in, your, in your list, because uh, it's not just this week, right? I hope that the legacy of this climate summit stays and that uh, you can build on, on what is happening here uh, these days. And to his left, we have uh, Pato Kelesitze. You come from Botswana and you work with GAN. GAN is the Climate Action Network. It's a huge confederation of uh, environmental NGOs, organizations working on climate change very, very active in the climate process. Thank you very much for everything that you are doing on the ground uh, in Africa, but also at the international global stage. Thanks a lot. And thank you, of course, for joining us today. And then we have Sijat Fayumi, a very dear colleague, former colleague of mine at the UN Climate Change Secretariat, the UNFCCC. Sijat is the editor of the French language content for the website, the social media, and of all the awareness raising. See, yeah, you have a lot on your plate. Thank you for being here, for making the time. And, and last but not least, we have Pap Camara. Pap uh, is uh, coming with Siyad from Bonn. Pap, uh, you are from Senegal, but you live in Bonn because you work with the United Nations Convention against desertification, the, one of the three sisters of the Rio Conventions. We have desertification, biodiversity, and climate change. And they are 30 years old. They are millennials, but they are not too young. And we are talking in a few minutes about uh, conventions and frameworks and uh, legally binding, binding agreements, because um, in the end, if we are here today, is because there is a Paris Agreement, right? The first universal legally binding international accord where 198 nations or parties agreed to reduce greenhouse gas emissions so that we can stay within safe limits. Climate change is in motion. Unfortunately, we see it every day on the news. We must adapt. We must build resilience, but we have to reduce drastically our global greenhouse gas emissions at a rhythm that it is not the rhythm we are seeing today. So how do we bridge the gap between where we must be in 2030, half of the emissions we must uh, have, and then in, uh, in 2050, where we are supposed to reach climate neutrality? And our job, again, it is to inform and to mobilize action to reach those goals. And I would like to start with a very simple question, Keisha. How is Climate Week Africa treating you? How are you feeling about it? Um, can you hear me? Okay, yeah. So it's been it's been an interesting uh, week so far. It's a bit of a mixed bag. Um, I'm not real big on crowds uh, and a lot of information overload. So there's a lot of where do you want to look today? You know what's going on today? But yeah, com the conversations are really exciting. Um, we, the Nairobi Declaration just came out. I haven't had a chance to study it, but that's also the big piece that everybody's looking to see. 
what the actual results of the of the summit are. So I'll be very interested in that. Um, but I think ultimately, as an African, I come from Uganda, just next door. Uh, there's definitely a little bit of a moment of pride to see like there's such a big event and such a serious event. It feels like a little mini cop being pulled off in, in, in this city. So yeah, it's been a bit of a mixed bag. Interesting. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thanks for that. And Leon, how is it going for you? Super busy, I know that, but please yeah. develop. <laughs> yeah, it's been an incredible week. Of course, meeting new people, learning and unlearning and relearning stuff. But I also want to thank everyone who visited Kenya, because at least our spring class out there were not working. But because uh, the government knew visitors were coming, at least they fixed a number of things. So it's been a good week. <laughs> wow, I guess that uh, you're feeling a lot of stories this day. Yeah? You're feeling a lot and uh, I'm, I'm much more to come. Yeah. Pato, how is it going from you, from, from you personally? Um, good afternoon, everyone. So I think personally, um, firstly, I'm glad to be here. Always love being in Kenya. Oh, and then just to, to correct earlier, so I'm with the Climate Action Network South African node. Um, and then just in terms of being here, it's been lovely. Um, some stuff has gotten done, some good, some not so um, good. But what I wish I'd seen a bit more of in the corridors as everything is so busy is more of the people. So... Uh, more civil society, more move people from movements, uh, more trade unions, more women, more young people, um, more people, um, people with disabilities. Just we wish you had seen more people, um, more uh, people who maybe don't hold as much power as those who did end up in the rooms um, being here. But yeah, besides that, Kenyan people is always always very very lovely, and yeah, it's a pleasure to be here. Thank you very much, Pat. And sorry, for, apologies for the for the little uh, mistake. And uh, Sijad, well, I think that you are uh, together with the Kenyan government, comes people amongst the, the busiest these days. Yeah, How many hours of sleep are you getting every day? Yeah, maybe next week I'll get some. Uh, <laughs> no, I'm very delighted, obviously, to be here. It's so exciting. It's so exciting because it's the first of the four climate weeks that are taking place. So we have four regional climate weeks. And starting here with uh, the Africa Climate Week uh, gives a real impulse. Uh, in addition, that it's actually with the Africa Climate Summit, how important is this also for the African Union and for Kenya as a government? So, not talking about all the process and all the different uh, happenings, but like on the personal perspective, really, um, it's such a pleasure to go back and really getting in touch with whoever is really with the hands on the things. And exactly as you say, Pato, is. It's also those opportunities when you meet those people that are also out of the regular process, let's say, all those non-party -stake, non stakeholder, uh, civil society. Um, and those are the few opportunities that we have uh, to also meet each other in between the different organizations that we are working under the same, uh, for the same objective. So yeah, it's been so far very, very, very full, but very exciting, very happy to be here. And still it's not over. Climate Week is just starting. The summit uh, led the place now to the, to the more technical also, less political and more technical discussions. Pap, how is it going? I mean, I know you're busy because I saw you uh, a couple of hours ago, nonstop running around Nairobi, uh, you know, feeling uh, commitments all around the city. It's not just what's happening here, right? It's, it's been great. Um, love being in Nairobi. It's my first time in Kenya. So it's amazing. So I'm gonna go back. But one of my main maybe take back from the whole conference, I mean, so far or the summit, is President Ruto being so optimistic about green growth being um, a source of opportunity and business for the continent. So I think like I'm gonna before technical part of the week, I'm gonna go back a little bit on the political side, mm -hmm. and uh, that is true. I mean, climate is a big subject, but green growth also is like. Um, a great opportunity for the continent. So I think that's, that's one of my main feedback. I mean, in general, from the from the, from the summit so far, and it's been really an, an amazing an amazing experience. And love this. I love this country so far. I think I'm gonna move here after this. <laughs> don't, don't record that. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Pap. I've been to quite some climate weeks um, in different regions of the world, and I must say, 
this is the most impressive, not just because, of course, the numbers, uh, the summit, uh, or the, the, the initiatives uh, at the highest level, but also the mobilization, right? I was at the Madai, uh, Wangari Madai Institute uh, a few days ago, and I, I've been talking to the Green Army and the young people, uh, even studying journalism, studying mass communications, and how engaged they are with climate change as a cost cross-cutting subject. And the next question that I would like to throw to the table is, how is this Climate Week and the Climate Summit aligning and serving the purpose that you are reaching as an organization? Because this session is about capacity building for you and for people uh, watching online to help them be better uh, as communications. And here we have people who are really at the forefront of climate and sustainability communications. How are you using Climate Week and the Climate Summit to achieve the goals of the UNEP program? Kaisha. Right, so UNEP is primarily a science scientific organization. We produce research that uh, we hope informs policy. Um, it's essentially, we, we want to achieve an understanding by policymakers, uh, you know, at a conference like this, for instance, of the science behind the cli behind climate change trends in climate change, so that as they are going towards COP or making you know driving national policy or regional policy, they're sort of factoring in the science that we found. Um, just ahead of this week, for instance, we released uh, two reports: one with IOM on. make sure that policymakers have all the options available for, you know, how, how to end plastic pollution, how the agreement could look. Um, so they're equipped effectively with what they need or contributing, certainly where there's a lot of science coming out before COP, we'll have uh, reports on adaptation, on emissions, on cooling, so that the delegates at, at the COP will um, hopefully, you know, have a toolkit um, that, they, that they can use to sort of develop what they need to do. Yeah. Thank you, thank you very you much, much. And, and I encourage everybody, everybody to, go to go to the UNEP website and check out those uh, reports. Uh, it is very important, I mean, the, the work that UNEP is doing in linking the dots uh, between the different aspects. It's not just about greenhouse gas emissions, it's about the, the right to breathe air, to have fresh water, and, uh, and, and of course, on a livable planet in the end. And before going to our civil society, if I may, uh, colleagues uh, in the panel, I would like to turn back to Siyad and, and Pap and ask about the Two Sisters Convention. How, how does Climate Week, Africa Climate Week, fall into your overall climate con? How is this a stepping stone towards achieving your goals? You know, could you give us um, maybe some examples so that the, the people in the room can learn maybe from your experiences? Hey, that's a good question. So it, it's also about how you take not the event as a single one, but how do you put it also in a series of different events that are also leading to the COP28 this year, right? Um, basically, it's, it's, so we are a convention. So we are, uh, we, we are a convention of 198 parties, as you mentioned, under the Paris Agreement. So what we, what we would like to do is, as a communication, is that we support the work of the different division of the programs. So all the technical work that has been prepared that is actually being brought to the COP. Um, the difference, as you say, with the normal agency is, if we can say it that way, is that we, um, for example, we are uh, basing our communications is always on the scientific 
places, right? So there's obviously the IPCC report, the UNEP report, and the other sister agencies that are doing the report. So there's different tools and different communications activities that we bring. It could come from the social media to website to articles, newsroom, press releases. Um, what we also like to have usually in those events, and this is the opportunities where we try to find who can uh, bring the voice of uh, specific categories, let's say, or who can be eventually give a voice and make people hurry, heard, sorry, uh, where there might not be other opportunities. Um, I don't like to, to say influencers, but like, let's say people that have some uh, influences. <laughs> um, uh, yeah, that's also one of the, one of the tools I would like to, to, to take advantage when we're on the ground, when we have that kind of events. Pap? For myself, I think uh, I'm with the UN Convention to Combat Desertification. So we work on land degradation issue, on drought, and all of those issues. So I think like what Mariana said earlier was important. Everything like is kind of like interlinked. So we cannot talk about land degradation without talking about climate change. We cannot talk about climate change without talking about biodiversity loss. So everything is like kind of uh, in a certain way interlinked. Like even if we, if we think the whole SDGs, right? So being here also, like I said, see, 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 I said. It's just like a way also to connect with real people on the ground, but also to, to, to make things happen. A lot of negotiation also happens uh, here, not in their, uh, not in their, you know, in the main offices, but also in, in the corridors. Uh, a lot of things happens there. So being here, uh, also you take those opportunity of like see, seeing those uh, right stakeholders and talking to them, whether for us as communication professionals, um, influencers or people that can, you know, that can, uh, that can take our message and our, uh, our, our words um, beyond and, but also like both in terms of for, for our executive to make also, to meet also the uh, right people in terms of influence and policies and all of that, I was also talking about policy. I think that's why actually we, we are here as UNCCD. Thank you. Thank you, Pap and, and Sijat. And now, Let's look outside of what we used to call the bubble, and it's less of a bubble. Uh, the numbers speak by themselves. And let's look into the civil society, right, which is um, everything. It's uh, very often oversimplified. Uh, we need to land the narratives onto the territories, and for that, journalists and civil society organizations doing the work, the information and the mobilization work on the ground are critical, otherwise these processes will be completely disconnected from reality. And Leon, you have the sources, if I may, the communicators, but you are the one who sits at the newsroom in front of a camera going live on TV and telling the people what is happening here. What are you making from Climate Week and from the process? Uh, first, I, I have to say that uh, when, 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 when we talk about communication in the first place, the first question should be, who are you communicating to? Who is your target? Uh, I've received more than 500 press releases this week alone. Mm. And you see, I prioritize. Some of them, honestly, are too boring. They're too wordy. We have people who don't know how to communicate. And they're in the communication space. If you don't have a smoking gun, I won't even take two minutes to look at that. I'll kill it. Yeah. We kill stories every day, by the way. It happens. We, 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 and if, uh, and I, perhaps I think that's the reason, if you look around keenly among the communication space, you'll find nowadays many companies are, are employing journalists. Have you ever asked yourself why? Because my job is very interesting. It's about humanizing all the policies you guys come up with humanizing those press releases. It has to make sense to a Kenyan who doesn't care about climate. They don't care about carbon credits. They don't. You feel carbon... Personally, I even don't care about carbon credits. I, I feel it's greenwashing. Anyway, that's my, my personal view. But um, who are you communicating? What are you trying to communicate? Those are the things you should be asking yourself. Look at it this way. Imagine you're telling your best friend a story of how your day was. How would you start it? That is now journalism. Because we are writing to human beings. So once you start a press release, for example, and it's with all the jargon, 
you've put, you've glorified your organization in the first five paragraphs. I don't care. I honestly don't. But there are some communication experts who are doing a fantastic job. That's why you always send press releases to newsroom. You wonder why journalists never pick them up. Because we receive like 500 in a day, 600, and we have to prioritize. So if you are boring me in the first two sentences, I put it aside, I move to the next one. So you, my point is you have to go back to the drawing board. Ask yourself, who are, what am I trying to communicate? If I can't understand it, how will that person going to buy the newspaper the next day understand? How do I make science interesting? For example, on Monday, I decided to go to Green Park while people are sending those, you know, green hydrogen, what, what, what. I met a very young Kenyan from the slum who was just painting away and using art to tell the climate story. That is the person I gave my column to. Because to me, it made sense what young, how young people are using poetry down there, how they're communicating to each other. It was easy for me to humanize because these are pe people who live with a climate crisis every day. Now, translate that as a policy person because you're not writing those policies for trees. You're actually writing for human beings for you to impact that change. So how do you generate impact? How do you ensure that your press release or your communication is very reasonable to a human being somewhere who has probably never met you, who's going to read and be interested and give you space. That's what I would like you to kindly reflect about. Thank you. So don't be boring if you want to be an effective communicator. And uh, yeah, I mean, 500 press releases per day, that's, that's huge. I hope that uh, UNEP, uh, UNCCD and UNFCCC <laughs> came at the top of the pile. Um, but yeah, you touch on very important um, issues. Uh, communications must be relatable. We're talking to human beings, uh, and, and we very often, I did corporate communications uh, before and institutional communications, and yeah, we kind of tend to um, tend to adapt ourselves to this jargon, and we very often, even being a journalist myself, very often I, I forgot you know, what a real human story was because we got bogged down by uh, the technocratic uh, language. So, yes, let's take out from our mind the boring language and talked about what matters to the people. And um, what matters to the people, how to mobilize people, Pato, from Khan perspective, um, how are you using Climate Africa, uh, Climate uh, Regional, uh, Climate Week, sorry, um, to reach your goals? in South Africa, but also in the region, and maybe maybe how this falls into your uh, COP28 strategy, that would be very useful. Okay, uh, thanks. So in terms of as um, CAN SA, we did put out um, just a statement pre-AC, pre-Africa Climate Week, <laughs> um, that one can take a look at, but it was around making sure that Africa Climate Week is about African people. Um, there was a statement. There was a, a statement that was signed by I think over 400 uh, organizations across Africa that was demanding that Africa Climate Week needs to be about the African people. So when we come here, we're trying to make our best effort to make sure that when we come to Africa to the African continent, in an African country, um, in Kenya, and we all meet our heads of state um, of African countries. They're making decisions for African people. They're making decisions that will serve the African people. The decisions that they make are centered on human rights, and not only human rights, but um, justice. The commitments that are made on the floor above us should serve the people of um, Africa. And that's what we're trying to make sure. Um, that's what uh, we try to make sure with um, while here, the week before uh, my colleague Tando Lukuko was here, they were also looking at um, the energy, at energy strategies and renewable energy strategies that are equitable for the continent. And then additionally, um, as a network and with some of our members, Africa Climate Week helps us strategize. It helps us organize because 
if we're to do something as civil society, if we're to do something and move um, move the needle, we need to organize, we need to coordinate. It is how we'll be able to take on people who hold significantly more power than us, significantly uh, more resources. And when we organize, then good things happen. Um, so parallel to Africa Climate Week, the Real People's um, Assembly was happening. I don't know if some of you heard about it. Some of the sessions were streamed. And the idea with it was that this summit has not brought the people here. It's brought the leaders. It's brought, um, you know, um, some people who may have a level of access and the like. But where are the real people? And then taking that into um, consideration, then we've got um, the Real People's Assembly, which ended today. Uh, so, yeah, in terms of, as Isi can um, how this then feeds into what we do and our COP28 strategy. We're able to meet with our partners, meet with our colleagues, meet with like-minded people and organize, make sure that when we're showing up, we're showing up fully. Uh, when we go to COP20, when we go to COP28, there are certain decisions um, there are certain decisions that will be to the detriment of people, not only in Africa, but globally, because we also have um, memberships across, well, um, we also have nodes in other parts of the world. So coordinating to make sure that we're speaking with one voice. Um, we know the power of civil society. Um, we saw it at COP27 where loss and damage um, finance facility wasn't going to be negotiated because um, we had been granted the Santiago network. But civil society kept, the, not just us, but we all came together to demand loss and damage, to demand that it's negotiated. And we got... Well, the structure, currently we're then um, negotiating what's going to go in and so forth. But it, it, that win was because of organizing, was because of coming together with like-minded, um, well, within the UNFCCC process that would be um, called developing countries, coming together with um, like-minded developing countries and making sure that all of us who wish to remain below 1.5, who wish to phase out uh, fossil fuels are speaking together we're in and we're in every room pushing and um adding pressure uh, and with that very long uh, response um i hope I've, uh, I've i've responded to you and then the last one as well we're using spaces to coordinate to keep um to keep account to keep those who are making them accountable there's a declaration that was made here today if we went through the room, I'm sure everybody could come up with a declaration that's been made so far that's not being made. So as civil society as well, we make sure that we try to, we use our power to, um, for the good decisions that have been made to make sure that they're held accountable and actually become a reality. Thank you very much for the very complete uh, assessment. Now, it is clear we have a problem here. We have a problem of political will, and we have a problem of communication that I would say it's a problem of disconnection. Disconnection from reality, what are the stories and the issues that matter to the normal people, those five, 495 press releases that probably ended in the trash bin. Um, so how do we, as communicators, right? We are not head of states. What is it that it is in our hands as communicators, head of media, journalists, um, uh, mobilization of grassroots organization. How can we help connect the worlds, keep those in the driving seat accountable, that they deliver on their commitments, but also engage uh, with those who feel disconnected, the general public and important sectors of the society that are not yet on board. How, as, as communicators, can we bridge those gaps? Keisha. So, um, yeah, I think one key way is what Leon said, don't bore people to death. Um, but then also, I think communication is, 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 a, is a kind of interesting um, dynamic. It's two-way, for starters. You have to sort of understand who your audience is and what and how they will consume the information that you give. I mean, UNEP, as I said, produces scientific reports. I am not a scientist, so I spend a lot of time telling scientists I didn't understand that. If I didn't understand that, nobody's, no, nobody else is going to understand it. So break it down into terms that the average reader, the average news reader can understand. Um, if you're speaking to people in Africa, since we're, since we're, since we're in the region now, um, it's, it's useful to speak to them about the, the issues as they affect them, sort of at a human, people-centered 
sort of narrative to it so it's relatable. Um, uh, I think the language you choose is really important. I saw a tweet yesterday, I, I don't know if they're calling an X, a post yesterday on X, um, where someone was discussing the fact that um, the name for climate change in Swahili is really, really complex. I think it's called Mabadiliko Ya Tabia Ya Nchi, right? Which is, you know, nobody knows what that is, right? So I think if you're going to communicate it effectively, that there needs to be an effort made to make the local, the most spoken languages, uh, sort of the people who speak it, understand what these concepts are, simplify them, you know, for everybody, and make sure that they exist within the language as it evolves, you know, so that it's not you're not sort of planting foreign foreign ideas and foreign sort of words with, without real meaning in them. Um, I think that uh, that's 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 another another key thing. Um, you have to have channels for feedback. I find that that's really important for communications. Um, I frequently speak to journalists uh, to find out what it is that's going to keep my press release from being chucked in the in, in the in, in the bin, right? Versus you know being kept and sort of used as a headline or not. You know, I think it's, it's important to see what you're doing wrong and what you're doing right. Have a message. I mean, a lot of the time people just sort of put out press releases just to put them out. It's a vanity thing. You know, you want to make you know donors happy or whatever. Um, I'm very clear that you know the press release has to be saying something new. You have new data. How, why is it important? How does it fit in with the sort of grander scheme of, of, of um, you know, the, the, the climate conversation? And uh, does it engage people? You know, uh, is it is, is it's not just about governments or, you know, certainly not not, not necessarily about the, the private sector, but you have to sort of figure out how it's affecting the, the community and so on. Yeah. Well, thank you. Thank you, Keisha. Silla Dampap from uh, the two sisters, two out of the three. <laughs> the other one is in Montreal, a bit far away. How, how are you helping bridge those gaps? I, I think like what she just said is really, really like struck me about like science putting out knowledge and being translated into a uh, communication product. I think yesterday, uh, President Adesini said something important. What gets, what, what gets measured gets done. And I would like to say also what gets measured is easily communicated. So if you have those knowledge and those facts and those numbers, it's easily like translated into like communication product, easily communication product that can be uh, digested by everybody. So science has to be clear and uh, our science colleagues are doing a great job about that. It's now like at our communication level to like translate those product like into digestible, digestible product. But also more than that, I mean, we have um, civil society that we've been using and uh, quote unquote, people, influencers, I don't want to use that word but <laughs> too much, <laughs> but yeah, I mean, we have been using those uh, those, those, those people. There's a uh, civil society organization with UNCCD, uh, a lot of people that are like using their voice and their network. I mean, sometimes even like small network. I feel like we, we tend also as organization to think about people that have millions of followers and the impact might not be even there. So what about if you're reaching out to somebody that might have one million followers that will not be engaged and don't believe in it, why don't you reach out to 10 people that have 500 followers and that are dedicated and know what they're communicating about? And I think like those aspects that we need to think about, we need to think about how we can translate science. Again, what, what's, what get measured it easily communicated, and I strongly believe in it. And at UNCCD level, uh, I think that's what we're trying to do in terms of like communicating the science properly and reaching out to the right people uh, that are devoted to the course, course and understand it, and that can also translate our message. Thank you, Pap. And the agency or the convention, which is very much at the center of uh, the attention and the huge expectations are put every year, increasingly in every COP. Uh, this year we have, uh, they say, the most important COP after the Paris Agreement in, in Paris uh, was sealed. So no pressure, Siyad, <laughs> but how are, how are you trying to make this understandable and impactful for the 8 billion people out there? Yeah, I think, honestly, every single COP is as important as, like, every moment where you can bring all those parties together on under one topic, and this is what it is. So sometimes I know, just a parenthesis, and this is really a personal observation, we often hear that all those cops, those big messes happening, and you have like so many people joining in. What do we see out of this? But I think if you go back to reality, just the fact that you have all those parties coming together for the same objective, or at least discussing about the same topic, 
that's already a huge step ahead. If, like the world is, could they be leaders? Could they be journalists? Could they be civil society? Could they be activists? And this is great that this is happening. This is really your personal perspective, although there's a lot of things that should be much better than what's it. But uh, yeah, just on this. Um, it's also interesting, it's true, you have to know your audience, but you also sometimes in our work, and maybe this is even more real for the convention sisters, you look like really good sisters, um, sometimes we, we also have to question what are we talking about? So are we talking, and what for? Are we talking to an audience to mobilize it? Are we talking to an audience to inform it? Are we talking to an audience which is already engaged that we want them to be like the little soldiers and bringing the information even further. So there's there's also this question which is pretty difficult for conventions just like ours when the really the, the core of the work is very technical and sometimes is, as Keisha has said very rightly, difficult for us to understand even because we're not technical, we're not scientific. So we have to put ourselves in uh, in the shoes of whoever has to read this. So obviously the audience, but what is the purpose of our communications as uh, UN agency, but also as different organizations? So those are the questions that we, we that are constantly basically uh, motivating our work. Um, and yeah, and, and just one more thing, and this is also something that we're learning of being here, and every time we are convening under the same, uh, to the same places, we also, I, I think, and this is very, important from a communications perspective is like we are all once again could they be UN agencies, bilateral agencies, activists, civil society, we are really getting or willing to go to the same way, willing to really push for the same objective and the same achievement. So those moments also are moments of partnerships and partnerships is also true and real for communications. So the, how do we support each other when we can complete each other as different organization. And this is where I think there should be some opportunities we could still explore it, because I don't think we have been doing enough or as much as we should. Uh, but yeah, maybe that's that's an objective where partnership in between across boundaries would be something to explore also. Thank you. Thank you, Sijad, because I mean, you, uh, you gave um, the space for the next question uh, for Pato and Leon, which is, what would you ask the other side? I mean, we don't have governments here, okay, but what would you need to see from governments, UN agencies, businesses, which are more and more involved in these um, climate weeks and COPs and so on, for your work, right, to be more impactful? How is it... Uh, about partnership? Is it about more transparency, more data, like uh, Pap just said? What would you be your ask, Leon? First, thank you for mentioning partnership at a time when journalists are looking for facilitation for COP28. <laughs> so, <laughs> yeah, so the, the, the thing is, number one, let us build a relationship in the sense that don't only just contact a journalist when you have a press release. They're human beings, they're not robots. So many of them, we have these conversations in newsrooms. You make some of them feel used. You know, cultivate a rapport. In fact, in journalism 101, the, 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 talking to building sources is about cultivating a rapport. Sometimes just find out how their day was. You, you never know the outcome. Okay. Secondly, let's be truthful as also you are truthful to your bosses. If something you look at it as well, you've written something, even you yourself, you don't believe it. Please don't send it to me. I mean, don't send it to me. Number three, what you send in terms of communication has to make sense. Don't pitch to me that Safaricom has donated three beds in Nairobi the relevance of that. Not everything is public concern. Maybe some things you are doing as a give back society, you, you have to also validate because my job is to look at the wider picture. What we are publishing has to make sense to 50 million Kenyans who read the Daily Nation, for example. So here's how you go about it. 
if you are in me with me in any WhatsApp group, I usually talk about my grandmother. You know, as a journalist, I visualize what would my grandmother think about when she thinks about climate change. Would she care about carbon credits? Probably not. But I've had this conversation with my grandmother, and she's very concerned that when she was a little girl, the depth of water in the river at home was like up to her neck. But right now it's diminishing. Here's the point. We are very lucky that in our continent, we don't have climate deniers, actually. People know something has happened. They know cows used to go in a certain field and graze the whole day and disturbed. But nowadays, there's no grass. Let's build on that. My point is, from a policy perspective, from also we journalists, we are telling the climate story wrong. We are focusing on things that don't matter. When you ask people out there, what is climate change? They don't know. So who are you calling for loss and damage funds for? If the people you are calling for loss and damage funds in their name don't know what is happening. It means we are not communic we are not reaching out to these people. So how do we get there? By going back to the basics. That's what me I try to do every day. I visualize myself. For example, uh, she mentioned something very important. We did not bring the people who climate has impacted to this con uh, to, to this conference. We didn't. Out there, I have met a man who has 12 daughters and he has been busy marrying them off because he cannot afford to feed them. He didn't get a chance to come to this conference. I can show you a girl I met in Kibera slums down here who told me he slept with a man to get 50 shillings to buy Gideri food to eat. And he got pregnant at HIV in the same, in the same situation. That is what people are dealing with. I think we are looking at climate, the climate crisis also from a privileged perspective. If you go out there, these things don't make sense to some people. They, they don't see how someone could sleep hungry. Are we reaching out to them? And they're a huge chunk. So as you make policies, as you generate, are you honest with yourself that it's going to help someone out there? Or are you doing it to impress your boss? Thank you. Wow, thank you very much, Leon, for these very fundamental questions that uh, at the end of the day, communicators, we also are humans, even if we work for a huge organization, a huge UN agency or a corporate entity, in the end of the day, we want meaning, bring meaning to our job. I'm, I'm going to end um, with uh, asking, um, Pato, from your perspective, you are super active um, in the global uh, and local spheres. Um, you are really mobilizing uh, people around the hot topics, uh, reducing uh, or leaving fossil fuel uh, in the ground and uh, climate justice, etc. What would you like to see from the other side, from more the UN organizations and corporates coming into the table uh, that will help you? Uh, mobilize. Okay. Um, so I thought this is, so I'm going to put this aside because this is where I'd prepared the effective uh, communication strategies that we use at SACAN to engage um, policy in South Africa and policy makers. Um, so in terms of demands, um, seeing as we're, we speak as civil society, although I'm with Climate Action Network South Africa, when we came here, like I said, we came to organize um, and then there was a statement that there was a declaration from the Real People's Assembly as well. So it, it's only fitting that when you ask for the demands, I then share the ones that were um, put together that build on um, and acknowledges numerous people's manifest manifestos and declarations and demands and is as representative of the space um, as possible. So these are also available online, but the solutions that are demanded in the declaration, I'll read them, is a redefinition of development from perpetual growth to genuine development. So it's not just every, every day, it's not just D, um, GDP that counts. And then um, endogenous African development that breaks dependencies and advances collective self-reliance. So even in terms of how we are getting the funding for, um, for the development, and the third one, ensuring provision of basic and essential needs um, for everyone. Let's start with human rights. It doesn't make sense that you have to have a certain amount of money in your pocket just to have access to water. There are certain basic human rights that um, people should be able to access without having um, to jump through hoops. 
and then finance and climate finance so solutions for real um, development. Right now, there's almost daily during this conference, there's been declarations um, and commitments of money. But what does that money actually mean for the people who are not in the room or at this conference today who have been the worst affected, who are um, the most vulnerable? And then also looking at a people-centered renewable energy and um, energy democracy as we look at our strategy for how we will um, give energy and not just energy to switch on, on and off the light, but equitable energy um, to people who may need it. Just because you're in the um, village, a, a rural area, doesn't mean that you shouldn't have a fridge. And then um, in terms of agroecology, agro agro and we also demand agroecology and food sovereignty, not just food security, because you can give someone pap every day and say, well, you're food secure, but is that what they need or want to be eating? And then pan-African collaboration on strategic resources. As we know, um, within sub-Saharan Africa, we will be the worst affected by the, by the climate crisis. We need to come together. We need to speak as one voice. We need to share resources if we have any chance, one, of um, advocating and pushing forward solutions that serve um, the continent and all the countries um, on the continent. And then social protection and just transition provisions for workers and communities. Currently, uh, we're looking at just transitions because we do know that fossil fuels must end. They do. Um, that's not where our future lies in terms of Africa. But as we look at that as well, we need to do it in a just manner. Just transitions, the just is not there for, for um, decoration. It means justice. So as we're transitioning, um, as the policymakers are transitioning, UN, as you're supporting, um, as you're supporting um, transitions, make sure that you keep the justice in them. Anyone can transition, anyone can lead a transition, but what we demand is one that has justice in it. Um, ecosystem protection and restoration. Um, let's stop the, the land grab, let's stop compromising African homes because we're saying we're responding to um, climate change and the like. And then the ninth one, precaution and safeguards. Um, keep, the, keep Africans safe. Keep our environment safe. Keep children safe. Keep us all safe as we as we um, go towards um, uh, acting on climate. And then the last one is control of and dismantling dismantling power of um, transnational um, corporations. Which, uh, if you look at how this, um, if you look at how the summit plays out, there's a very loud voice of that. How are we making sure that? We are redistributing where the power lies so that in a conference that should be about um, Africans and what's best for us, um, we're not leading um, with maladapt we're not leading with false solutions such as fossil fuels, carbon markets, geoengineering, um, and other um, export-led growth and the like. So those are the demands um, from us as civil society. All of these are available um, online on um, it just got published, I think, today as well, alongside the uh, today's declaration. Thank you very much, Pato. And uh, before we go, I apologize because we have uh, very little time for questions and answers. But nevertheless, I would really like to give the opportunity to the to to you uh, to raise your. You, you don't need to raise your hand, or maybe uh, raise your hand, but. Uh, Go to the microphones. There is nobody hanging them um, out there by the sides. So is there any question in the room? Yes, please, if you don't mind uh, introducing yourself and addressing the question to one person in the panel or in general to everyone. Thank you very much. Mine may not be a question per se, but just to take on what uh, Leon has talked about, that we look at climate from a privileged position and a men position. I'm adding the word men. Because when you do communication or reporting, you hardly talk less about how it impacts on women. And you look at uh, environment as a woman and women are there to be exploited. And that is why you deplete the forest, you deplete the minerals, you deplete everything, thinking that you're depleting a woman, and therefore you cannot talk about it. If you look at all the panels have uh, gone around, there are mainly men in the panel. There are hardly women, and maybe if women are there, they are like what my friend there is doing, 
repertoireing or chair of the panel, or like that. So unless we listen to women, unless we take their experiences to the board, to the table and all that, we are not going to do anything because even the miners, the fisheries, the war, the fishers and all that, they are all men. So let us take conversation to the grassroots and listen to the experiences of women and use it to navigate this. If we still take it as, as, as a women, a men thing, and those in position of uh, decision making, it is too sad. Even today, the African leaders, they are all men, except one from Tanzania, and the voice cannot be heard. So think about it, thank you very much. No, thank you. I guess um, there was no comment. It was there was no question. Sorry, it was uh, a statement that we can only agree with. I, I think. Uh, would you like this to say a word? Uh, one of you on on the on women. Okay. For in, first of all, all of us are products of womanhood, so we have a duty to protect and respect women at all times. Secondly, uh, if you covered COP, if you attended COP twenty seven, there's a question I asked. Is it time we have a shared COP presidency in the sense that we have a man and a woman? I totally agree with you. When you enter a boardroom and you hear men talk about energy, they talk about energy and fuel that will pollute the environment more to set up industries. When we talk about, you hear women talk about energy, they talk about energy in terms of lighting homes, cooking, energy that benefits everyone, including the men themselves. So having women to the, uh, as part of the conversation, it's, it's something that must and always should happen. There's no disregard about that. If you're referring to panels, TV panels, sometimes women don't just want to wake up to, go, to come to the studio. We invite them. I can show you emails. Come here today, I am not coming. It's 6 a.m. is too early. And men are always willing. They, will, they run. So spaces are there, especially in media. If you've worked in a newsroom, you try to give interviews, you do. I'm one person, if you check my byline, I give voices to women more than I give voices to men, actually. Because especially health, the health and science stories that I do. But it's also something to do with the mindset. When, when, when a journalist approaches you, speak to them. That way, we'll, we'll be able to get to know what is happening so that you also get into those spaces. Thank you. Thank you. Yes, please, Pat. Um, can I add on to what my fellow pa panelist has said? Um, so to agree with you, smashing the patriarchy is climate action. Um, but also on women not wanting to take action. Last Sunday, um, here in Nairobi, at Pride Inn, the African Women and Gender Constituency, um, um, well, under the UNFCCC, but it's the African note of it, was launched. And this was launched and planned by a room of feminist women, strong feminist women who work across the continent, who are doing brilliant work that we sometimes don't know about because, like you said, it's not platformed. When you look at the newspapers, um, who's there? The journalists who were in the room, it was actually covered because the Minister of Gender of um, um, Kenya was there. But the journalists, most of them who were in the room, were women. So are we, um, we do need to make an effort to platform women's stories more. And then on what uh, my colleague just said about women not wanting to wake up in the morning. <laughs> <laughs> I think, I think we need a so, clarification there. So, I'm no, speaking no. from experience, no, personal no, daily no. experience. <laughs> okay, first, he is, isn't it because they need to take care of the children, take them to school, and the man is not? Not, not, not necessarily. Some of them are single women. I know they are single because I interact with them. Yes. So, my point is opportunities will always be there. It is not a competition. We will always better when we uplift each other. Me, I will never deny anyone a chance. I, gender is the least of my issues, but I'm more interested in the content in your head. Thank you. Okay. So um, after that interruption, I'll continue. 
Um, so when we talk about women not wanting to wake up in the morning, as you also added, when a woman wakes up in the morning, she's not only responsible for herself. You don't just wait. If you're cold at five, you don't just get up. And because you're up, because you're showered, it means you can go. Who are you leaving the people that you're responsible for with? And if media actually wanted women in the room, if um, it was mentioned that gender is not an issue, if gender was an issue, the media would make an effort to accommodate those differences. That way, it would show an intention to actually bring women into the room. Right now, we talk about who's not in the room, who's not uh, being platformed. With all of us, with the power that we hold, we need to look at what can we do. Um, the UNFCCC, there's things that they can do. As um, SA can, there are things that we can do. But also as media, it's easy to point fingers. If no women are coming to your studio, then fix how you're addressing, uh, addressing women or how you're calling them in. Right now, we're talking about policymakers and communicating with them. If they are making broken um, climate policies, yes, we can go and shout and say they're not listening to us. But maybe we need to communicate better. Maybe when we bring women into the room to talk about climate change, we need to, um, we need to invite them in in a manner that actually works not only for them appreciating the systematic oppressions that they are under. Um, and yeah, Whew. with that being said, it can't be climate action if it does not take into account um, women. We can't have climate justice without gender justice. If your the way that you do your work does not speak to gender justice, please fix it. If you don't know how, there are incredible feminist organizations that are doing incredible work, incredible research, publishing papers. The knowledge is there for you to just pick up. There's women which is doing um, work around women and mining and as a result, climate justice. There's Femnet who's doing work. Awid is doing work. As, um, Urgent Action Fund for Afri um, Africa, because it's the one that I know that I sit on the advisory bo body of. They are doing work. Women are acting on climate, and it's very unfair to ignore them and then say because we ignore them, they're not. Okay, now I'm done. Thank you, Pato. Thank you very much. And I think that with this uh, statement, um, yeah, I think uh, we, we must end because there is another a group of people waiting to take up the room, and I can only thank you all. Thank you, Keisha. Thank you, Leon, Pato, Sillad, uh, Pap. Thank you very much for taking the time to discussing and exchanging. Thank you very much to the public in the room for the very, very good comment uh, made from, from the floor as well. And thank you to everybody who's watching online. And this conversation doesn't end here. We need better communications to have better climate action. Thank you very much. Have a good evening. Bye.